Histo, you've published with Cambridge University Press, Excellence in Bilingual Education, a guide for school principals. Tell me, why did you write this book? Well, in one sense, one could say it's a happy marriage. Uh, Cambridge International Examinations, uh, it's my understanding, when they've been working with their partners in the field, they've heard that a guide of this type would be appreciated by schools. Also, over the uh, last dozen or so years as I've been working with schools that are establishing bilingual programs, I've also tried to manage some of this knowledge. Uh, and, um, and this seemed like the perfect outlet for it. So there was a need for this book, and it gave you a chance to gather all of the uh, information that you've uh, encountered over the years uh, in this very valuable uh, guide. Uh, yes, and, and, and also uh, not only uh, information that I've been able to garner from uh, those who are working in the field, but also by doing a rather thorough, uh, extensive uh, literature review uh, to see uh, what research also says about bilingual education, to, to make sure that uh, what practitioners are, are saying is also backed up by research. Is this guide only for school principals? Absolutely not. Uh, eh, granted, the uh, principal is the, perhaps the primary reader or the intended reader. However, the reality is that bilingual education is, is really so complicated that it simply can't be orchestrated by one person. It requires a team effort. Uh, it requires teachers, parents, uh, those developing learning materials, researchers, uh, teacher trainers, um, local administrators, inspectors, etc., to all work together in building a, a, a bilingual learning environment that helps students to achieve. Um, so, in fact, uh, there's a, a great deal of material in there that is suitable for, uh, for some of those other stakeholders uh, in bilingual education. Now, in chapter one of your book, you define key terms. This is very important. Um, what do we mean, first of all, by bilingual? Well, I think there are probably as many definitions as there are people in some ways. Everybody has their own perception of what that term means. Uh, so perhaps the most important thing to do in bilingual education is for people to agree on what that term means uh, for them in their context. Because I've certainly met lots of people in life who have been speak who've spoken to me through the medium of their second or third language and tell me that they're not bilingual yet. From my perspective, they're absolutely bilingual. So, uh, generally speaking, a bilingual is a person that is able to use uh, two or more languages uh, uh, for communication on a regular basis and for engaging in intercultural communication. Well, this leads us on to bilingual education. What do you mean by that? Well, once again, I think it's very important to agree on that term to, uh, uh, with the various stakeholders because the, once one has agreed on the term, one has a sense of what it is that one can uh, achieve. So from my perspective, bilingual education, uh, in bilingual education, two or more languages are used for the teaching of various content subjects such as mathematics, history, geography. And ideally, this uh, throughout the last years, at least throughout the last years of a student's education. Uh, but that's not sufficient uh, as a definition, because I think it's important to have some really strong objectives that are tied to it. Um, I think it's also important to state that uh, bilingual education seeks to have uh, students uh, develop their uh, first language, their mother tongue, their, and to ensure that that continues to develop. It's important in bilingual education that the L2, or the second language, uh, is also developed at, at an age-appropriate level. Furthermore, in bilingual education, one would not want to put a student in a situation where they're learning less content. So one of the goals is to ensure that that is a rich learning environment where the students are learning just as much content in maths classes or science classes as students would in, uh, in a monolingual program. Um, then it's also important that students develop uh, an understanding of the cultures that are involved uh, 
uh, not only an understanding but an appreciation for those uh, cultures. Um, I think it's also important for students to uh, have uh, developed the habits, uh, the interest in and the habits of uh, intercultural, intercultural communication because ultimately we're learning to speak a second language so that we can communicate, so that, uh, so that we have that resource. And, and if we have that resource, we should be using it. And finally, I would say it's important that students develop the, the basic thinking skills, the habits of mind, the learning skills that they need uh, for lifelong learning. Because if one, if one hasn't uh, thought through all of those things, then it's difficult to actually uh, prepare, plan on one's program. Now you talk about mother tongue in your first chapter. What, mm -hmm. is, what do we mean by mother tongue? Well, I wish there was an easy answer to that question. Because a child can have one mother tongue, uh, they can also have, uh, the child could also have a father tongue which is different from the mother tongue. It's also possible that uh, the grandparents may speak yet a third language. Uh, and that the, that the children are, uh, may spend a lot of time with the grandparents. So in fact, it's, it, it's quite difficult to define what is a mother tongue. Uh, for instance, there are situations where parents themselves do not necessarily fully respect their own first language and feel it's more important to teach the society, uh, the dominant language in society to their children first and the children may only later on in life learn that language uh, which would have been their mother tongue in, in a different set of circumstances. There are also environments where parents, uh, where languages are politically uh, oppressed uh, and parents feel it's, it's wiser not to teach the mother tongue to children and once again the children might learn to speak that mother tongue, that language which would have been their mother tongue later on in life. But then in those circumstances, there is reason uh, uh, to call that second language uh, uh, a child's mother tongue. But uh, perhaps uh, the simplest way of defining it is, is simply to say that mother tongue is the primary language uh, through which a child has been socialized. Peter, another term that you define in chapter one is, of course, CLIL. Now, tell us what CLIL means. Content and language integrated learning. It was a term that was coined in the early 90s, and, uh, and it's caught on. And I think one of the reasons that it's caught on is because it describes very well what it is that goes on in bilingual education. Whereas other terms such as language immersion tend to focus more on language, whereas in fact in a bilingual education context, uh, one is learning both content and language. But uh, yet again, uh, same case as it is with many terms, people have various interpretations of it. So one could say CLIL has many faces. What are some of the faces of CLIL? What are the different types of CLIL? Well, there are some people that believe that uh, CLIL is, is for teaching a third language uh, or a second language, but only teaching a few subjects through, that, uh, through the medium of that language. There are other people, again, that see immersion programs, whether those are total immersion, uh, uh, two-way immersion, or double immersion programs as also being CLIL programs. So it, um, the term actually unites a, a, a diverse community working on very different types of bilingual education. So you've talked about different types of CLIL. Um, which face of CLIL do you think principals should consider for their schools and well, why? Well, I think that's always context dependent. It depends on so many things, uh, whether one has the staff, uh, whether one has the interest, whether the parents uh, want this, whether the students want it, uh, whether the learning materials exist, etc. So I would always say it's context dependent. Now, bilingual education, CLIL, um, these different types of CLIL you've been discussing uh, bring benefits, substantial benefits with them. 
Could you talk about some of the benefits that the student uh, can receive from this education? First of all, if we simply take the concept of bilingualism, if a, if a child uh, exits from a bilingual education program being bilingual, they get a host of benefits that are associated with bilingualism. Uh, for instance, Bielostok at uh, York University in Canada has looked at dementia in, in, in bilinguals. And one of the things that she and her colleagues have found is that uh, bilinguals are able to stave off the negative effects of dementia for an extra four years. Uh, it, the pathology is still present, um, but it seems that bilinguals may very well have more robust neural networks. Uh, and therefore can bypass the pathology. So that is a tremendous benefit, not just to the individuals that are concerned and their families, but also to society uh, for uh, dementia uh, costs uh, society a great deal. There are a, a host of studies uh, that have looked at the benefits of bilingualism. Uh, f for example, uh, we know from other studies that uh, uh, students, uh, bilingual students, are better able to concentrate uh, on their goal when they're presented with distracting information, when they're presented with distracting information. If we take into account the fact that we're living in this information-rich society nowadays, we're constantly being bombarded by information. So the ability to, to remain concentrated on your task is particularly important. Uh, for a society, there are potential trade benefits. Uh, uh, there is research showing that uh, having a common language with another nation, for instance, fosters trade. Uh, there is other research that shows that a lack of that language may actually make it more difficult to trade. Um, there is research by the European Union uh, where uh, small and medium-sized enterprises have been asked uh, uh, about uh, their language knowledge and, and what, uh, if they ever feel that the lack of language and cultural knowledge may have cost them business. And in fact, uh, quite a large number of businesses have said that yes, they may be losing business. There's, we could go on for quite some time. There's a very long list of, uh, of, of benefits, uh, likely benefits uh, for um, the bilingual individual and for societies that uh, have uh, bilinguals. And of course, one of the interesting things that you do in your first chapter is you talk about the benefits that this can bring to the school. Uh, could you talk about that a little bit, please? If a school is going to establish a bilingual program, it's going to have to do a little bit of navel-gazing, in a sense. It's going to have to look at what it has done up until now. It's uh, going to have to plan for bilingual education. It's going to have to think through some of the consequences. It's going to have to think through the pedagogy. It's going to have to think through the teaching and learning environment and how to build a rich learning environment. Because after all, bilingual education, in a sense, places extra demands both on students and teachers. Uh, so that requires quality pedagogy. So there are quite a few school directors or principals that have said that bilingual education has actually acted as a, ref a motor for reform. Uh, furthermore, it, uh, it's a way of drawing additional atten uh, attention to a school, additional resources to a school. It's, uh, it, it provides a school with a greater number and students with a greater number of learning materials that they can access because they can do that in two languages. Uh, so there are actually a, a host of benefits that uh, for schools that decide to establish bilingual programs. One more definition and a crucial one I think. You've mentioned the quality pedagogy. What do you mean by that? Well, pedagogy is the art of teaching and learning. And uh, we know a great deal about uh, what works in education nowadays, uh, not just from various uh, research studies, but also meta-studies that have, uh, have tried to look at uh, thousands upon thousands of studies and synthesize uh, some of that learning. Uh, so we know, for instance, that uh, 
that students tend to learn more and student achievement tends to improve if we foster cooperative learning uh, over competitive learning. Uh, we know that it's important to foster learning skills, uh, to help students become autonomous learners. Uh, we know that it's important to use assessment for learning, uh, to make sure that both uh, the teacher and the students are learning through assessment and are, uh, are changing their practices. Um, so there's actually a great deal we know about pedagogy. Uh, that can, and in bilingual education contexts, because they're more demanding, it is important to be particularly careful about applying some of these best practices. So excellence in bilingual education is about excellence in education by itself, and it really makes us look at our practice carefully and reconsider what we're doing to make sure that we are giving our students the very best. Absolutely. And I think also whenever one establishes a new program of any kind, one is in the spotlight. Bilingual education, uh, people working in bilingual education often have to work um, doubly hard to convince others of its value. Uh, this in a sense is, is kind of interesting because I, I, I don't think anyone ever has proved that monolingual education is superior to bilingual education. But when you do something new, you're always put in the spotlight. You're, uh, people always expect more from you. And in a sense, high expectations, which, are, uh, which, which may require more effort, actually uh, should deliver greater returns. And in fact, uh, many researchers who have looked at bilingual education have said that high expectations for all is, uh, is a cornerstone of successful uh, uh, bilingual programs. So we walk on. Peter, in your chapter you talk about early start and late start programs. Now surely uh, it would be better to start early because of uh, the neuroplasticity uh, in a young person's brain and this idea that they soak up languages like a sponge. Uh, or, or is it okay to start late? Well, young people may have, uh, young children may have a particular facility for learning languages, but, uh, but in fact older learners are very often more efficient learners. Uh, so there is no right answer, once again, as to what is, is the more appropriate uh, option. Uh, one has to take a lot of factors into consideration. First of all, uh, it, uh, is is the mother tongue, for instance, is, is that first language uh, a strong language? Um, uh, if that language is disadvantaged, it may be very important to actually begin with the first language and concentrate on that. Um, however, if that language is, is not disadvantaged, yes, one could uh, very well start with uh, an early immersion program. However, one has to have the teachers. Uh, the teachers have to be able to speak that language and speak it well. Uh, one needs to have the learning materials and one needs to take into account that the, as that program moves through the education system, we're talking about a 12, 15 year change uh, that is going to have to be taking place. All that has to be planned for. It will require resources. So. Um, there, if one doesn't have all of those teachers, uh, a late start is also a very good option. Um, it depends on the context, depends on the resources one, one has, it depends on what a community wants, uh, because that is central. Uh, people's beliefs, in fact, are central to uh, their willingness to, uh, to support a program. You talk about beliefs what people believe about language learning um, and you've talked about many of the benefits of uh, bilingualism. Are there any risks? Well I don't think there are any risks per se with bilingualism as a concept uh, but of course uh, there are risks associated with establishing a bilingual education program and uh, one of them is will one find a sufficient number of qualified teachers? Uh, how, uh, if that program continues to grow and it begins to displace those teachers that were teaching through the mother tongue before, 
uh, how will they react? What kinds of tensions might that create in the community and so forth? Does one have the trainers uh, who can support teachers in, in learning the skills that they need to learn? What would you say uh, if a principal came to you and said, look, Peter, I have a very strong language program at my school. My students uh, are studying three languages, um, and it's of high quality, and they're coming out uh, with uh, proficiency levels in at least two of those three. I believe that this is a bilingual education. Well, their, uh, their students may be graduating with high levels of proficiency in those languages, but I would not call that bilingual education if they're only uh, having language lessons, uh, if they're not studying any of their subjects through the medium of the second or third language. So for you, the key is really content and language integrated learning. It's learning the content through the second language. Uh, yes, absolutely.